Good evening and welcome to At Issue. I'm Twyla Young. And I'm Skip Jacobson. Whenever the foibles of Americans are discussed, our eating habits inevitably come in for a lot of persecution. You've probably heard these sayings, maybe even used some of them yourself. We eat too much sugar. We eat too much cholesterol. We eat too much fat. We eat too much junk food. Or we just eat too much. Or we eat too little fresh fruits and vegetables, too little fiber, too little lean meat, but rarely do we just eat too little. Well, one result of our eating habits is a spreading feeling that we weigh too much. Whether or not we actually are a country of overweight people is not what we're going to talk about this evening. What we are going to talk about are ways we go about trying to shed those extra pounds. We're also going to look at some new ideas about weight loss where exercise fits into the whole scheme. And we'll look at some changing ideas about how diet affects our overall health. Americans spend over $100 million a year on diet books. Besides that, think of the untold number of diet plans published in magazines, special diet supplements, drugs. Some are downright desperate means of losing weight. It could lead one to ask why individuals keep looking for that miracle diet that will take off that extra 10 or 15 pounds quickly and easily. The solution to the problems that these things are designed to, uh, to take care of are complex. They're not easily achieved. And uh, so people are, are looking for something that's quick and easy. That, uh, you know, the idea that something you tie around you or uh, something that you take as a pill is easier than restricting your food intake or taking exercise or a combination of both. The quickest way to lose weight is to stop eating. Uh, I don't recommend that. I don't, what, what is the reason why people should be in such a hurry to lose weight? You know, it, it may have taken us anywhere from one to 30 years to put the weight on. And we should be <coughs> content to give our body adequate time to, uh, to adjust to the process of losing weight. Many experts in the field of medicine and dietetics say there is a whole raft of specific medical hazards involved in so-called fad diets, and we'll look at some of them in a moment. But first, let's look at why people spend so much money in response to the promise of quick, easy weight loss. Uh, they're looking for an easy way to lose weight, and the easiest way to lose weight is to, is to spend all of your time walking uh, between bookstores looking for books. And that's the secret. Don't buy the book, just do a lot of walking. Okay. Well, the, you know, the problem is not <clears throat> that the books don't, the diets or the regimens in the books don't work. Uh, most of them do. Uh, the problem is that they don't teach the dieter or they don't teach the reader enough about <clears throat> a new lifestyle so that the person can, can keep the low weight that they might have achieved following the regimen. Mm -hmm. What kind of new lifestyle are you talking about? An understanding of what it was that produced the obesity in the first place. We'll talk more about that lifestyle, how it develops, and how to change it a little later in this program. But first, let's look at some of the specific diets which, because of their techniques and their claims, could be called fad diets. We'll look at the validity of those claims and some of the potential pitfalls in following their plans. One such diet is a liquid protein diet. It is heavily advertised, makes extravagant claims of weight loss, and causes Dr. White considerable concern. He talked recently about it with Skip. When in this morning's Sunday Des Moines Register, there was a full-page ad on the uh, burning away more fat each 24 hours than if you ran 14 miles a day. Some of the claims that they say are this is without fasting, without <clears throat> need of willpower, without constant pangs of hunger, or a single moment of body-racking exercise. It was uh, hailed as a weight loss breakthrough of the century by the, pe the doctors at the Boston Medical School. Obviously, these people have money. It's a full-page ad. I counted four other diet plans in this morning's mm -hmm. paper. And uh, what do you think of programs like this? Are they all, are they all uh, well, health I, hazards or fakes? I, how, can, how can one really know, you see, until you send away to find out what they're talking about? They, they're very skillful in writing their headlines as uh, an incentive to read the, uh, the advertisement, but the advertisement doesn't tell you anything. I strongly suspect, but I don't know this for a fact, I strongly suspect that the, what they're doing is advertising the so-called liquid protein, the hydrolyzed protein, the protein that is suspected of having caused nearly 100 deaths <coughs> in dieters uh, during the past half a year. Uh, if, it's, if it is, as it indicates, based upon the, the Boston Hospital studies, they're, refer, they're referring to studies by Dr. George Blackburn and his associates. 
And that is simply a program in which people consume lean meat, poultry, or fish in, an, in a given amount, and that's all that they eat. There's been no known difficulty with that regimen. The liquid protein regimen is kind of based on that concept in principle. The problem is that there has been almost no clinical testing of the liquid protein regimen. <clears throat> Those of us who are interested in human nutrition, and in particular in protein nutrition, have been very concerned from day one about that liquid protein regimen. We've warned people that it is an experimental diet and it should be followed only under the closest of medical supervision. And that kind of advertisement makes no reference mm -hmm. to medical supervision. Uh, anybody who responds to that ad is a fool. <laughs> Let's look at some other uh, programs. You mentioned the uh, liquid protein, which has been in the, in the papers. How about the high protein, low carbohydrate diet? I suspect, but I don't know. I suspect that that is one that is becoming more and more popular now because it's being more highly advertised and promoted. Uh, you've read the ad, I haven't. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this one in which it talks about substituting uh, a protein uh, preparation for two of the three meals a day? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Well, that's uh, kind of, a, kind of a, a new thing that uh, is <coughs> simply designed to make dieting convenient. It's generally a powder that contains about 50% body weight or 50% of the product of protein, and it's mixed in a given quantity with Oh, perhaps orange juice or skim milk and uh, one glass of that is used for breakfast and one glass is used for lunch and then you are given in the program menus for evening meals it comes out to be around 1200 calories there is absolutely no magic by virtue of the fact that it makes a protein claim one could accomplish exactly the same thing exactly the same thing on, on straight caloric restriction reducing portion size while consuming 1,200 calories, and it would be a lot cheaper. There are also the low-protein diets, the rice diet, the pumpkin carrot diet, the banana diets. What do you think of programs such as this? Well, they, they have uh, no merit beyond being calorically restricted. Uh, they're <clears throat> usually designed to, pro to produce monotony, and people who are on weight reduction programs sometimes feel that they have to punish themselves and one way to punish yourself is to, is to force yourself to eat the same food day in and day out. That's real punishment. Uh, if, there, if the person consumes fewer calories than they expend, they will lose weight. There's no question about that. But the problem comes <clears throat> after the, the weight loss has been finished. The patient, the individual has learned absolutely nothing in the process. He's learned nothing about portion size. He's learned nothing about combinations of foods for good health and good nutrition. So the chances are that within a few months that weight will have gone right back on again. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're just, that's why they're called crash diets. The weight goes down in a hurry and it comes right back up again. There are several other types of crash diet programs. Plans which are designed to take off a relatively large amount of weight in a relatively short period of time. Most of them are based on some type of drug or supplement or on the radical alteration of one's diet. In other words, a diet where you would eat unusually large amounts of a certain type of food or little or none of some other type of food. But besides these kinds of crash diets, there are more drastic measures, like fasting. Total fasting should be employed only in situations where heroic measures are called for. By that I mean the person's health is in some jeopardy unless they can lose weight. Uh, total starvation is a very fine way to lose weight because without question you lose weight until you die. And the trick is to stop your fast before you die. In any event, uh, <coughs> it is uh, something which is uh, gained a considerable amount of popularity now in the medical profession. But generally speaking, they want to do it in the hospital only or at least keep the individual in the hospital long enough so that they know whether the person is going to develop any problems. I don't believe that that starvation beyond a day or two uh, should be followed uh, without medical attention. And one of the reasons is that uh, a usual side effect of, of fasting is uh, our periods of uh, very low blood pressure. It's called hypotension. And during the times of low blood pressure, one can become confused, uh, one can even faint, and certainly not be prepared to, uh, to react to an emergency. And I certainly would not, would not want to have my cab driver uh, be on a total fast and then pass out while we were in the middle of state in Madison in Chicago.
Of course, food fads aren't confined to weight loss programs. There are a lot of reasons why many people want to make some changes in the type of food they eat beyond a desire to lose weight. This interest in eating more healthful food has led to a mushrooming popularity in health food stores. Health food stores have been with us for a long time, but more and more people are becoming interested in so-called natural foods and the other options that health food stores can provide. We ask Margaret Tate what to expect from a place of business that bills itself as a health food store. You can't expect the health food store to do what uh, nutri good nutrition education has not done. And we are quite excited that it, there are has been recent legislation that is going to increase the amount of nutrition education offered in public schools and I think that's a real plus because I think it still does take some uh, discerning to purchase wisely in the health food store just as it does in the in the grocery store and um, the health food store may offer some inter interesting varieties of grains and things that you don't find in the uh, um, regular grocery, although you certainly can find an adequate diet in, in the grocery store. And I think you have to be careful if you're concerned about um, calories, for instance, if you're concerned about weight, that some of the um, granolas and things that you buy in the health food store are really quite high in calories. They have honey in them, perhaps, instead of uh, refined sugar, but the calorie value is about equal. So far, we've looked at several crash diet programs which promise quick weight loss. They are, in general, looked upon with skepticism by most nutritional experts. The feeling among professionals in the field of nutrition is that a quick weight loss program, while perhaps successful on a short-term basis, will likely not help you to keep weight off over a long period of time and could as well be damaging to your health. So does that mean that someone who wants to lose a few pounds, keep them off, and stay healthy at the same time is condemned to a 40-year-old diet menu taken from the yellowing pages of some textbook? Not at all. In the first place, exercise plays an important role, both physically and psychologically, in weight control. And just in terms of caloric intake, there are some encouraging new ideas on the dietary horizon. We'll look at those things and talk a little about the way diet affects our overall health when we return. which promise quick, easy weight loss, use as part of their selling points, the claim that you won't have to do any boring, time-consuming exercise. But most experts who have studied the success of persons in keeping weight off over a long period of time agree that exercise is a vital part of an overall weight maintenance program. One of the reasons for this is that, in general, an adult's caloric needs will gradually reduce at a rate which, if that adult does not alter eating or exercise habits, will cause a weight gain of about a pound a year. 
But if you've been inactive, Dr. Philip White says, start out slowly. The usual recommendation for, for that is that they begin walking. And I understand that some people who are, who are magnificently obese uh, may have to be content with walking 100 feet the first day. <clears throat> and under those circumstances where the person has been grossly inactive, then physicians recommend that they simply extend the, the walk a little bit each day until, in fact, they're walking a mile or more. Uh, I think we should probably all shoot for a minimum of uh, three to five miles a day of walking. And then beyond walking would be <clears throat> exercising more muscles in your body, and swimming is a superb example of that. Uh, active sports, uh, tennis, racquetball is uh, becoming very popular now. And then we go from there, I suppose, to jogging as a way of, of uh, burning up calories and, and uh, exercising muscles. You, you would say then that walking should be started before someone should hit the tennis courts or go out and jump into the swimming pool or bike 20 miles or something of this well, sort? Well, anybody who, who jumps on a bicycle and bicycles 20 miles or less is downhill the whole way uh, is foolish. <coughs> not, not only because they won't be able to walk the next day, but because they're they're starting on a program that is going to be finished in no time at all. Obviously, a program of conditioning has to begin slowly, but be built in such fashion that it is an enjoyable pastime, or it's, it's a fad itself. Another technique of weight control is behavior modification. This is just the opposite of a crash program. Anyone who embarks upon this kind of thing needs to know from the beginning that it takes a long time to see results it is designed to take off weight over a long period of time, but that it appears to be, when done properly, very successful at altering a person's eating habits to the extent that the weight loss can be maintained. Someone involved in a behavior modification program should be keeping an eye on the nutritional balance of their diet and needs to be giving thought to portion size. However, the thrust of this type of plan is to determine when you eat, where you eat, and how you feel when you eat. With that information, a person can begin to work on changing the habits that are causing such things as between-meal snacks, extra helpings, and absent-minded nibbling. Basically, this type of eating plan can be called safe and inexpensive as opposed to quick and easy. Psychologists claim we eat the way we do because of learned habits and attitudes. Our eating habits reflect conditioning we've experienced all our lives. Does behavior modification work in losing weight? Yes. It does if the program is properly done uh, and done over a sufficiently uh, long period of time so that the individual has a full understanding of what's involved. The fact that a person has simply been told that his lifestyle is conducive to obesity uh, has, has learned the problem but hasn't learned how to correct the problem. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily a panacea, but done properly it can certainly be a great help. Behavior modification involves your own determination to stick to the program, a little knowledge about how to keep track of your eating habits and what to do with that information when you get it. You can get a detailed brochure from your local extension office which will tell you all about this type of eating plan. White says that whatever technique you decide to use, be it on your own, in a group, whether you read it in a book, buy it through an advertisement, or hear about it from a friend, there are some things you ought to look for in evaluating that plan. With this bombardment that the normal person gets from all kinds of weight reduction programs, what steps would you advise a person to take in evaluating a diet plan? Well, there, I think there's plenty of good information around <coughs> that um, uh, can help, can, can teach you enough about nutrition so you can do a kind of a self-evaluation of whether the diet is a good one or not. I suppose the next thing is not to believe more than half of what you read, if that much, when you're reading a, an article about or an advertisement for a product to aid in weight reduction. Um, <coughs> my mind now is thinking of the word permissible puffery, and permissible puffery is a, a word advertisers use to say a little bit of excessive claim is okay. Uh, watch out for that kind of thing. There, are, there is professional help available through uh, most, uh, most city and county and state health departments, through uh, universities, uh, particularly the state universities have extension programs that have nutritionists and dietitians that can help advise people. Uh, <clears throat> finding, finding good books written by physicians who have uh, a, a little bit of a, bibli a bibliography is, is another way to tell. By that I mean that unfortunately most of the 
physicians who have written the so-called popular diet books have never published anything else. And so you never find in their, on the fly leaf of the book, a listing of their publications or journals where they've published. Uh, that can be a clue. I suppose the best bet would be to, uh, to ask a, a dietitian uh, whether she knows anything about this, the regimen you're interested in, and if so, uh, how could she get started on it? Weight loss is not the only, or even the primary, dietary concern for many people. The importance of diet in our general health, in preventing disease, and in treating disease is a field that many experts feel ought to be more fully explored. In the past, nutrients have been identified in terms of minimum daily allowance. But there is some feeling that just getting enough is not enough. More recently, it's been suggested that we ought to do better. We ought to try harder. We ought to, in fact, be able to devise a diet which we consider optimum, not only for meeting requirements, for, but for prolongation of life and the prevention of chronic disease, the killer diseases that uh, are so uh, much a threat to us, like atherosclerosis that's the basis of strokes and heart disease and cancer and liver disease and diabetes. The chronic killer diseases are an important public health problem and the question that people are asking now, can we change those diseases by diet? And the answer is probably yes we can to a certain extent. We certainly regulate diabetes. Diabetes is regulated by a combination of diet therapy, insulin and exercise. The Describe four it. food groups were, were set forward as, a, as an aid to education of the layman. Mm -hmm. Because if he got foods from these four groups, he got essentially all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, enough calcium, enough protein, and so forth. What is being done now is to define <clears throat> the new level of dietary goals in terms of percent of calories, say from protein. Not only from fat, but from kind of fat. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, the liquid oils the monounsaturated fatty acids that's rich in olive oil and the saturated fats that tend to be rich in, in certain animal kinds of fat. Mm -hmm. And we say that one way of describing it is in terms of percent of calories. Now that's a scientific term the layman may not quite understand but then we have menus mm -hmm. and people at Iowa State University and the Home Economics Department are very good at translating these chemical kinds of prescriptions into foods and I think we may need a new set of food groups if in fact we could be convinced that this would help in preventing, say, coronary artery disease. There are some people that have advocated for a long time that um, cancer can be controlled by diet. They've advocated that uh, um, other sorts of diseases can be controlled by diet. Those people have frequently been called the health food enthusiasts. The many of them are um, a seeking to, to sell special products and, and sell books and that kind of thing. Now, aside from whether they're quacks or whether they're whether they have something. Is this a trend we're going to see in the future and continue to see? Well, I think, I think the, one of the uh, attitudes in America today is that uh, we need good health care, we need better preventive medicine, and diet is a possibility. And people begin to take on the dietary thing as if it were true. It is a possibility, it is not proven, but there's a lot of tokenism and superstition about diets. Food has a lot of emotional value. And some people switch from, say, religious faith to faith in foods. And the health food industry, I think, has is, is exploited that. They have claimed that taking wheat germ or spider eggs or honeysuckles or rose hips or artificial, or should we say, natural forms of the vitamins as opposed to the synthetic forms, which chemically are identical, will somehow will help you. And people take these products as an act of faith. They believe that they will be better. And through a psychosomatic mechanism, mm -hmm. confidence in your token, whatever it happens to be, they in fact do feel better. Let's say that there's somebody that's relatively healthy, going along just fine, they're, they're enjoying life, they get some exercise and that kind of thing. Yeah. As far as their diet is concerned, is it, is it appropriate enough now that they, they, they just eat foods out of the old basic four I think groups? the basic four is still fine. I think for a person who's healthy with a normal serum cholesterol and a normal blood pressure and a good family history, that meeting requirements is still good nutrition. I think weight control is very important.
I think we always we have the sneaky obesity syndrome. We are, we tend to be a little less active than we should. We tend to fight the discipline of regular daily exercise and so forth. But I think we should do that. Not that I'm a big jogger, but I play golf and I play tennis and I try to uh, at least feel fit in terms of being able to negotiate two flights of stairs and do ten push-ups. And I think that is still a pretty good guide for the healthy person. It seems, after listening to Mrs. Tate, Dr. Olson, and Dr. White, that there are at least a couple of important things to remember about dieting. Patience and an understanding of our body's nutritional needs. Then, if we can step back and look at the long-term effect that whatever diet plan we choose is going to have in our health and our overall eating habits, we will have a better chance at maintaining that weight loss and maybe feel a little better about ourselves in the bargain. Next week, Iowa Perspectives will present a special program prepared by the Iowa State Extension Service. It will deal with several new trends and ideas in helping physically handicapped individuals lead more normal lives. And that's that issue for this evening. For Skip and me, good night. Five, five, six, six, seven, seven, eight, and one, two, three, one, one, two, three. Twist. 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 Twist.